Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and I am so delighted to see everyone here for the second Tuesday with a Scholar History Talk. Today we're going to have Ed Lauterman, who hands down wins the title for the best uh, title for the uh, uh, a talk this season, I think, the Pa Ingalls Syndrome. That was Pa Ingalls that I had on the screen there while people were coming in. So, um, very good talk. For those of you who have been here uh, before, you know that Ed Lauterman is the uh, Pioneer Press economics uh, columnist. He has talked at our library before, very popular. For those of you who have heard him before, You'll be happy to hear that in addition to this talk, he is going to be giving a series of talks on uh, economic history in, um, is it April? In April. In April, yeah. So we are delighted to welcome Ed Lauterman today. We are going to have a lot of other good programs. I'll just mention we're having a program in this space every Tuesday now through um, June. Uh, so mark your calendars. Next week we're going to have excerpts from a performance of the History Theater of Minnesota. The name of the performance is Stewardess, and for those of you who are of an age to remember when there were stewardesses as opposed to flight attendants, you won't be surprised to hear that being a stewardess was a very challenging and exciting and also somewhat a sexist field to be in back in the day, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that next Tuesday. All of these programs are made possible um, through our great partnership with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota. We have Martha with us today. If those of you in the community audience want, want more information how you can join that fine organization, speak to Martha who will raise her hand. And I would also like to mention our financial sponsor, Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund without whom we could not do this. So now, thank you very much. We couldn't do it without any of you either. So thank you very much, and I will turn the podium over to Ed Lauterman. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's gratifying to see so many people here. Uh, I'm not sure if that's an indication of my abilities as a speaker or just <laughs> sort of general boredom, but uh, I have to note that when I pulled in here, um, I said you can tell when there is a history lecture at the Roseville Library because all of the handicapped parking spots are filled already at 25 to. <laughs> and as a, I talk a little bit about technical change in this, um, and we have some marvelous technical change if you compare us to the era of Charles Ingalls or my grandparents or probably your grandparents or great grandparents. Uh, at exactly this time, a week ago, Tuesday, the 15th, a an anesthesiologist was putting a, something in my spine, and I had my left knee replaced. And a week later, I'm here. Now, I'm, I have to say, I'm not quite as focused as I would like to be. <laughs> uh, and I took non-opioid um, pain medicines today, so I would be as focused as I am. But, uh, but it is... I, I thought, it, I mean, I think that's one of those things, having grown up in a small town in Minnesota in the 1950s and thinking of all the people, you know, who hobbled around with canes or who were blind in their 60s or nearly blind, functionally blind because of cataracts. And now we get a knee replaced or a hip replaced or we get our cataracts done and then we go on with life. But anyway, I, I think this is a good title. I hope it isn't the best part. I hope that the talk doesn't go downtown, downhill from here. Um, and it really, excuse me, uh, it really stems from, I, I taught at Augsburg for 10 years or so, uh, and have a friend there who was a bibliographer at the library, and he, in his, as a private activity, he does um, genealogical research for people doing family histories. And he had a client for whom he got, a, a client who, from a German family somewhere in west central Wisconsin on a farm, and the story was, you know, great grandpa came from Germany and settled here, and that was it. And then when Ron started doing this 
this archival history, it turned out that Grandpa had lived seven other places in between Germany and that town in western Wisconsin. And the, 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 the client said, well, how do you explain this? Why did he do this? And, and Ron could tell from experience, this, that actually is fairly common, that people came here and they often moved around a fair bit in a fairly short period of time before settling on what we think of, oh, that's the Lauderman or the, the Ryler's Dam or the Jones or the Johnson or the, you know, uh, the, Bier the Bierke family farm. So uh, he ended up, I, I talked to his client, had lunch with him, and, and we talked a long time. It was just an interesting conversation. And so the question is, um, you know, why did this happen and, and why were immigrant experiences uh, so different and often more complicated than what has been passed down in family lore? So I want to deal with, you know, why do people decide to migrate within a country like Charles Ingalls? He was born in New York, ended up in Smith, South Dakota, uh, or from one country to another like Cornelius Rotherstam, who is my mother's father. Are they pushed or pulled? Is it that they're leaving a bad situation? They're primarily, we need to get away from this. Life here is not good. Or is it that things really look better there? Oh, if we go to America, how great that would be. And there are a lot of parallels with issues we face today. And one is, you know, can we, can we divide people into sort of political or religious refugees versus economic migrants. I have Jewish friends whose ancestors left the Pale of Settlement in Russia because Jews were being killed. Whereas my grandfather left the Netherlands because he had gone to the United States. He was adventurous. He had a chance to go. And you know, once you, once you see Baltimore, why would you want to go back to, you know, to a little town in the Netherlands where everything is very strictly ordered and you can take over the same peasant farm, well, actually he couldn't, his older brother did, um, that your ancestors had been on apparently since time immemorial. Uh, so, you know, how, do we, how can we divide up the motivation of people? And why did it often seem to take several tries before people found the right place? An interesting question for why do they bounce around is, did they have good information? I mean, this is, an, this is the economist talking now. People made a decision based on information. Was the information reliable? Um, and when it turned out it wasn't, maybe conditions around Walnut Grove, Minnesota were harder than they thought they would be, then how did they adjust? What did they do? And to what extent do external economic factors such as business cycles, you know, booms and busts, recessions and expansions, or institutional factors such as credit availability and, and sort of on what terms could you get credit, or land ownership registration systems, how do these sorts of external factors affect what happened? And how do the factors influencing the decision making and the processes of migration change over time, and why do they change? Now here's Charles and Carolyn Ingalls, uh, and this picture is stolen from Wikipedia. Uh, Charles Ingalls was born in 1837 in a little town called Cuba, New York, but then moved with his family to Ohio, and then Illinois, near Elgin, which is now, you know, a suburb of Chicago, and southern Wisconsin, and then is up by Pepin, Wisconsin, by the time Little House in the Big Woods is written. And they go from there to Kansas, and back to Baroque, Iowa, Walnut Grove, Minnesota, Dismet, South Dakota, and he dies in Dismet in 1902. Uh, now, now there's a little interesting thing in here. If, if you go to the Wikipedia article, it talks about his father having been born in Canada and have, having come from Quebec to New York State. But it also talks about his roots of earlier ancestors in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. 
Now, does that tell anybody anything? What? Well, the most likely thing is that someone at the time of the Revolutionary War was a Tory, a loyalist. And Americans were very selective in our collective memory. And we tend to forget that about 10% of the population of the 13 colonies moved, were loyalists. And, you know, the English of the largest single source of stock there is, is American loyalists who moved from places like Massachusetts up to Ontario. And then many of them trickled back. But the percentage is about the same as the percentage of Cubans who left after 1959 which we wouldn't think of and we really don't, you know, we sort of ignore those loyalists and when there are movies or you know, there were things on Walt Disney Presents when I was a kid, you know, the Tories were the bad guys. Um, and Carolyn Quinter was born in Brookfield, Wisconsin, uh, east, oh, excuse me, west of Milwaukee. She married Charles Ingalls, accompanies him to all these locations dies in Dismet in 1924. She outlives him by 22 years. Now here are my grandparents. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm... Here are my grandparents. He, they're about 40 years generation or a generation and a half behind the Engels. Uh, born in my grandfather was born in 1876, exactly 40 years after Charles Ingalls, in Zevenhoven in the Netherlands. Uh, he moves with his family a, a short distance to the, to the small village of Vilnius. And then at age 20, he gets recruited to come to Princess Anne, Maryland. That's in Somerset County on, at the very tip of the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, because Dutch young farmers were thought to be good in vegetable production. And in, in, in 1899, Baltimore was the canning capital of the United States. It was the vegetable canning capital of the United States. Basically because we weren't subsidizing irrigation water in South, in the Southern California yet. And that had a big thing with moving, you know, uh, New Jersey was the garden state. Heinz tomato products were based in Pennsylvania because that was where tomatoes were grown. But all of those lost a competitive edge when we started subsidizing irrigation water in Southern California. So he comes here on a three-year labor contract, um, pays quite well, and it includes passage both ways. So at the end of three years, he goes back to his village, but he just doesn't fit in. And so he spends the winter there, and he woos the, vill the village schoolmistress, but then says, I'm off. And he goes and spends a year in South Helen, Illinois, which is now a, it's a suburb, but at that time it was where truck farms to grow vegetables for Chicago were. And then comes to Chandler, Minnesota, down by, the, the Slayton would be the county seat, um, the Slayton Pipes, if you know Slayton Pipes on over in Worthington in that little box. Um, because there were close friends of his, a couple who had been there, who were there for two years, and exactly why they came there, I don't know. And he initially farms with them for a year or so. The village schoolmistress, who was, I'll put it very politely, she had a prickly personality. <laughs> But she, looking at their, she was someone who had grown up in a, in a middle-class household, but when she was 16 years old and her father was 73, her father died, and he'd been a property owner. And they'd lived quite well, lace curtains on the windows, serving girl. But it turns out all these rental properties didn't belong to her. They belonged to the father's first wife for the duration of his life, but then they reverted to his first wife's children, and suddenly, at age 16, she and her mother, neither of whom knew about this, were suddenly completely impoverished. And she had to go to the normal school and become a school teacher and teach in a peasant village that smelled of Holstein manure. So she came, they were married in Southwest Minnesota in 1906 and farmed there the rest of their lives. Um, both died in 1944. Now, there's an interesting thing 
the first Dutch settlers there in that little, they were stupid. They split themselves among four counties, so there's quite a few Dutchmen in that area, but they don't have political power in any single county. <laughs> there's a bunch of them in Pipestone, a bunch of them in Murray, a bunch of them in Rock, a bunch of them in Nobles. But they're a minority in all the counties, so they, you know, they can maybe elect one county commissioner, but that's it. Um, the first one came, the first ones came in 1892. And by 1904, end of 1904, my father went there, there was a growing group, and he must have known well, his, his friends from his village must have known someone. And he went there because of these friends. And when my grandmother came in 1906, she came with a party of 14 people from that village. And that's an example of what economists call network effects. And you see it all the time in people coming from Mexico. You know, for the first person going, everything is strange and unknown, and you have to feel your way around and you make many mistakes. But then you're there and you get established, and you can send letters back to your friends. Or now you get out your smartphone and call them, text them. And once someone is there, then the costs for the next person coming, the information is better, it's more reliable, it's cheaper. And so, you know, a couple of people come. And then, it, and then pretty soon it doesn't come. Anyway. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I keep giving the information. A, a couple of points to keep in mind. Migrants are not homogeneous groups. Just as the, the poor are not, homo, you're not a homogeneous group. Um, they vary greatly in terms of, you know, when they came, origin, destination, motivation, and maybe the degree of rationality in their decision to migrate. Second, migration is not a process of random selection. People who choose to migrate are not a random sample of the population they choose to leave. Um, it's the more enterprising people it's the people who sometimes are hard to get along with. It's the people who have to get out of Dodge for one reason or another. It may be a problem with the law. It may be a problem with debt. It may be somebody that's pregnant. It may be somebody, you know. And it, it includes the, the abused. And it includes abusers. Um, but they're not... People who are complacent, people whose situation is comfortable, who feel they're well off, they're not as likely to migrate as those who are not competent of their situation, not comfortable in their situation, or who have, for some reason, they're now shamed or outcast in the village. Um, so there's something called adverse selection in insurance and in economics, and it's the idea that, you know, you have to be very careful with setting up insurance coverage, because the people who are most likely to benefit with the kind of insurance are going to be the people most likely to buy it. And that's why you have suicide clauses in life insurance. <laughs> you know, life insurance policies often do pay in case of suicide, but there often is a period of a year or two years or something like that where they don't pay. Um, now, selection need not be adverse. If you want an enterprising, dynamic society, it may be good to have the people who are enterprising, obstreperous, and you know who are not necessarily good, like, easy to get along with, but they get things done. Just a couple of economic ideas or, or terms that I want to throw out, and we'll come back to these at the end. The first is imperfect information. And that's just when people really don't have good information to base a decision on. And sort of the, the textbook introductory micro model of you know, a, a, an unregulated, unintervened free market res, results in a societal income, a societal outcome that is ideal um, doesn't hold true when you have imperfect information. <laughs> you, you have, in most situations, you have imperfect information. 
it's a question of how, you know, how far from, how good does your information need to be? Now, asymmetric information is a situation where one party to some sort of deal has much better information than the other. And the person selling a used car tends to know more about that car and its little quirks than the person buying the car. And the land agent for some railroad in the United States who goes to Pomerania to talk to peasants there who are working with a German-speaking Lutheran Junker landlord while they are Polish-speaking Catholics, um, that person has more information about how good <laughs> the land in Stearns County, Minnesota may actually be than those people there on the Pomeranian coast. And so that's a situation of very asymmetric information. Now there are transaction costs. And that's just the cost of making a deal, the cost of crossing the Atlantic, the cost of getting established as a farmer, um, the cost of finding out about something. A special category of those are search costs, and that's, you know, when you need something, seeking it out. Search costs, for example, if you're looking for a good used pickup, it's um, cheaper, the search costs are lower once you have things like carsoup.com where you can go to and say I want a car that you know I'll pick up that's a half ton and a you know within maximum mileage this and whatever then if you have to go to printed ads in a paper and go down column after column I'll forward you know um, so Search costs are just the cost of trying to find out information about some, some alternative, some good or service that you want. Then there's the idea, and this is right out of Microrecon 101, of supply and demand shifters. You have something that shifts demand, people's willingness to pay for a product, or supply people's willingness to produce and sell something. And demand shifters might be, oh, um, it may be just taste and preferences. In 1990, we didn't all know that we really wanted to have, you know, double lattes with pumpkin spice or something. <laughs> but taste and preferences changed. A, a more serious one, when I was a kid in the 19, I was born in 1950. When I was a kid in the 1950s, per capita consumption of pasta in the United States was something like 2.4 pounds per person. And it was something that Italians ate in places like Boston and New York. And now it's something like 35 pounds per person. And pasta is made from a specific kind of wheat, durum wheat, high in protein, hard, now, when you go from 2.4 pounds per person to 35 pounds per person, it makes a change in the price of durum wheat relative to other wheats. And look at how much turkey we ate when we were kids compared to now. Um, turkey has skyrocketed, but beef and pork have come back. Well, technology can be a, a demand shifter. And uh, although it's perhaps, there are probably more examples of it as a supply shifter. When Cyrus McCormick develops a successful reaper so that the wheat or oats is at least cut and tied into bundles and left in the field, compared to cutting with a sigh with a cradle and then tying it up, um, that makes human labor more productive. You have to have horses, but you know, having that reaper reduces the amount of labor you need to grow wheat. And if those of you who've read the little house books, in, that, in the little house in the big woods, Laura's um, father and uncles and cousin are out cutting wheat with sides. Now, by the time they're out in Desmet, they have reapers. Um, if you read uh, Farmer Boy, when Almanza was a boy, they're taking, I think it's wheat, 
um, you know, once they have it cut and bundled, they're taking it in to thresh with flails. You have the threshing floor, and you have the, the little raised uh, wooden entrance to the threshing floor called the threshold. It holds the grain in when you're threshing with flails. Now, between Almanzo being an eight-year-old and the time Almanzo's out, you know, picking Laura up from her school teaching job when she's 16, because he likes her, um, flails completely went out and the thrashing machine came in. And that had a huge effect on the cost of producing wheat. It, it lowered the cost. It lowered the amount of labor needed, and it, it lowered the cost of wheat tremendously. Uh, some things were already known. People came to the United States for religious and political freedom. People came here for economic opportunity, higher standards of living. People came here for better, better education and social services. Libraries that had history series, perhaps. And I think most of us have seen some examples of this in film. Um, about 1970, you had the two about the Swedish immigrants, the immigrants in the new land. Uh, based on books by Moberg. Uh, and it's a saga that starts in Sweden. You have the poor farmers, and you have the boy who works on the mean landlord's farm who hits him, and he loses hearing in one ear, and so forth. And they're, they're from a dissenting church, and so they're, they're discriminated against. And then they come in this terrible voyage, and people die, and they end up near Taylor's Falls. <laughs> And I think any Minnesota farmer would say, if you were going to go to all the trouble of coming from Sweden to Minnesota, why the hell would you go to Taylor's Falls to farm? <laughs> Rocky, Sandy. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's the case of imperfect information. Uh, we're also mostly familiar, no, nearly all of us are familiar with Fiddler on the Roof, which has people, Jews, living in the Pale of Settlement in Western Russia. Um, and at times they're, they're discriminated against and treated badly, but tolerated, but then you have political changes, and they're used often by demagogic pop, uh, you know, politicians, and they're actually killed and beaten, and so they have to leave. Now, I want to talk about some of the, the push factors this is in a little more detail as an economist and as a, and as a amateur historian or a bachelor's degree historian. Some factors that people don't necessarily think about, a little more complex than just the thing, you know, we had freedom and economic opportunity. One was that during the period of great migration in the United States, Europe was going through a set of demographic transitions. And I need to go ahead and then come back. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not keeping, oh, I'm, I'm going the wrong direction, that's the problem. How many of you are familiar with the term demographic transition? Okay, a demographic transition takes place when you have a traditional society and both birth and death rates are high, but relatively stable. Now, this was, you know, something I took off of Wikipedia. And the birth and death rates are, the, the birth rate is the purple, the lighter purple. The death rate is the, the darker purple. They vary. I think they want to show while well, you have epidemics and things like that. Um, but they're high in terms of, you know, the number of children per woman, the number of births per 100,000, the number of deaths per 100,000. And then, for a variety of reasons, death rates drop. And it may be increased sanitation, it may be the early vaccinations, like for smallpox, maybe improved nutrition. Uh, when you get later in the 1800s, you know, you get um, Louis Pasteur and so forth. Uh, some idea of, of antiseptics in, in medical procedures. But blue, I guess it's blue, the death rate drops before the death rate drops. And birth rates follow them down, but there's a lag. And when you get to the, the last stage of the transition, both birth and death rates are low and relatively stable. <laughs> 
And the population growth there is low and stable. The population growth rate before you start is low and stable. But during that transition, the total population mushrooms. And this was going on in Europe. Uh, really the earliest you know, country, and, when they, and the process may take 50 or 80 years. Um, you know, when I, I went, I've went to Brazil 50 years ago and have sort of, it's been a love of mine ever since. When I first went to Brazil, um, the average number of children per woman was still over seven. And now it's at 1.8. They're not even at replacement anymore. You need about 2.06, 2.1 to have a stable population. Now that was in the period of 50 years. I first went there in January of 1969. Uh, so this isn't something that takes place in a decade, but this was started. Uh, Sweden was the first place where this really started, but you also get it in, in um, the Netherlands, in Denmark, in Germany. What I guess what I should what should also be said it's like the baby boom, and so you have suddenly there are more younger people. And so people who are coming to be 16, 18, 20, 22, they're seeing much more competition for jobs than the people who are 40 or 50 are seeing. And so part of the, of the pressure to, to migrate to find a job was just that you have, with these demographic transitions, you have this expansion in the number of younger people. And it's harder for younger people to find jobs. Now there's also the issue of land tenure systems. And you have places in Western Europe where you have sort of small holder, but, but you have small farmers, but they own their land. And then you have areas where there are large, essentially, you know, systems where you have large landowners, the German nobles, the German Junkers in, in Pomerania and, and East Prussia, and they have peasant tenants um, who have very little power and you tend to have more migration out of areas where you have the large land holdings There's the question of primogeniture Geniture and other inheritance laws and when I try to get into the details of this <laughs> There may be lawyers here. You, you may know more about this than I do But you have either as law or tradition in some European countries a system where the oldest son gets the farm and so if you look at migrants, you don't have many first sons. My, fa my grandfather was the second son. The first son gets the farm or the, or the, the croft or whatever, um, and the second son and the third son and their spouses are more likely to move. Um, this is also a period of decaying great empires and the growth of nationalism. Uh, you have the three great empires. You have the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it's run from Vienna and to a certain extent from Budapest, but you have Czechs, you have Moravians, you have Ruthenians, <laughs> you have Slovenians. Um, and as the 1800s go on, there is an increasing sense of these national identities. And you can see it in the music of the romantic composers. I mean, Liszt and, and um, Smetana, Dvorak, you know, Me Vlast, My Homeland, <laughs> Gypsy Dances. You know, this, these people in Vienna writing for the wealthy nobles and landlords, they're writing about a culture that we don't, we think of ourselves now as Czechs, as Slovaks, as Slovenes, as Moravians, as Bohemians, as Poles. We're Poles, but we may be, some of us may be in another great empire, the Russian Empire. And some of us are Poles and we're in East Prussia. Um, but we speak Polish, we're Catholics, we sing Polish songs. And we don't think of ourselves as Germans. We don't think of ourselves as Russians. We don't really give a crap about the Tsar or the Kaiser. 
So you have these big empires, but they are decadent. They're falling apart. Um, and I'd refer you to a very good book on this. Some of you know Barbara Tuchman's book about, about August 1914, the, outset, the onset of, the, of World War I, The Guns of August. But she wrote another book, The Proud Tower, about the 20 years leading up to that. And this decay of these empires is an important theme in that. Um, there's also, and let me say one more thing. Before the growth of nationalist thought, if you're a peasant on some estate in East Prussia, you might think, here I am, a poor peasant, and the Lord, landlord treats me badly. But as the 1800s go on, you may think, I'm a poor Polish peasant, and that German landlord treats me badly. And so as that nationalist identity becomes more important, there's more of a sentiment to let's get out of here and go to North Dakota. <laughs> you also have, as, as you move from the, the classical model of quasi-professional armies fighting wars, and the wars of Louis XIV, of you know, John... Churchill, uh, Duke of Marlborough, sorts of things, to larger nationalist armies, and especially after the Franco-Prussian War, as France and Germany are spoiling, or as France is spoiling for another fight with Germany, and as the Austro-Hungarian Empire is fighting to maintain itself, as is the Russian Empire, you start to get much more widespread military conscription. And it's, it's not that bad to, be, to think of yourself as French and serving in the French army. But if you think of yourself as Czech and you have to serve in the, in the Austro-Hungarian army and perhaps go to kill, to kill Serbs, for whom you feel a closer affinity than those German-speaking people in Vienna, um, then conscription becomes more onerous. And if you look at immigrants, you see uh, often there was a sort of a threshold where you weren't allowed to leave the country after, say, becoming age 16 or becoming age 18. Conscription was often around 20. But you see a lot of young men who go, you know, six months before they hit that threshold beyond which they're not going to be allowed to leave. Finally, there's blowback to European agriculture from technological change and occupation of great agricultural areas. So people have been growing rye and wheat and barley in Europe for millennia. But then you have two things going on. One is the introduction of the McCormick type reaper and the thrashing machine. The reaper first in the 1840s and the thrashing machine perhaps from the 1860s on. And you also have the opening up, not only of the United States, especially west of the Mississippi River, you have Australia, you have Canada, and you have Argentina. And so the world is flooded with grains, and the price of grains declines. And eking out an existence, you know, on a, on a, a share hold, on a, on a tenant's, um, part of a land holding in, in Pomerania or East Prussia just becomes impossible. There's a tremendous drop in the price of grains because of the technological change and a huge expansion in area. There's some pull factors. And the biggest one is just, there's land, you know, there's like, give me land, lots of land beneath the starry skies above. There's a broad, uh, voting franchise, uh, at least if you're a white male in the United States. There is this image of economic opportunity and growth. There's an image of low social and economic class barriers. And there's a perception that going to Canada or Australia is really, uh, you're better off if you're English speaking and that you're going to be a second-class citizen in those two countries. But that's not as true in the United States. Um, 
some factors affecting land availability, and one that's really important is that we underestimated the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And that's before we even have a constitution. It's before George Washington. But it sets up this system of counties and townships, of sections, um, and the demarcation of land, and it makes the transaction costs of land, tra of land identification of ownership and land transfer, it makes that easy. And that is enormously important. And the lack of that plagues Brazil today. <laughs> the lack of that plagues most countries today. You have the Homestead Act of 1862, and that is, sticks out in people's minds. But you have the railroad land grants. And the railroad land grants and the railroads, you know, they were given this land, but they needed cash to buy steel rails from Britain. And so they needed to turn the land into cash, so you have their land agents selling things. There's the Morrill Act, which transfers, uh, for agricultural mechanical universities, transfers federal governments to states. And again, they want to raise cash. Um, and then you have extensive and fraudulent bargaining of, of US railroad lands in Europe. Now, there's great technological change during the period if you see the films, the emigrants in the new land, these poor suckers from Sweden are crossing on a, you know, on a sailing ship and depending very much on the winds and weather, it may take you a long time. When most of the Irish came because of the potato famine, it was with sailing ships. But by the time you get to the 1870s, you have steamers that run pretty regular schedules. Um, and by the time you get to the 1890s, they really predominate. And communication becomes cheaper, faster, more reliable. Uh, my grandparents could get a, send a letter to the Netherlands and get a reply in five weeks very reliably. Now, that sounds like a lot. They, they sent a cable once at enormous expense. Um, but there is, there is improvement in communication. And agricultural mechanization continues raising labor, labor productivity, but it also imposes what economists call barriers to entry. Uh, when, when you're cutting wheat with a scythe <laughs> to get started, you know, you may need a, a, a single bottom plow for the horse to pull, um, but then you, you read Farmer Boy, Almanzo's father goes out and sows grain by hand. Well, by the time Almanzo's out in South Dakota, you need a grain drill, and you need, and you need a binder, a McCormick Reaper. And somebody in the neighborhood, some of you have to get together and you need a thrashing machine. So it takes more to get started. Now, I'm running a, let me cut through the last few things quickly. <laughs> Migration takes place against a difficult, paradoxical, and poorly understood macroeconomic background. The period from the Civil War to World War I is a period of enormous increase in available resources. People from Europe, land, forests, white pine in northern Minnesota, iron. It's a period of tremendous technological change from the Bazemer converter to the, op the Siemens open hearth furnace, bigger locomotives, all sorts of technological change. So it's a period of huge growth of the US economy as a whole. But it's also a period of enormous poverty, frequent recessions, <laughs> and desperate economics, particularly for those in natural resource, and I think I'm missing a few words here, extraction industries, which is a fancy way to say farming, forestry, and mining. So times were very hard for individual households, particularly ones in those fields, um, at a time when the economy is growing. Now there's, it's a very hard to, to see graph. This is something from, there's something called the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is a private organization. But they identify and date recessions, and they've gone back to the 1850s. And, well, this runs from 1850, 1850 to 1920. But each of the vertical boxes that has a bar across the top is a period identified as recession. 
And you have some that last six years. So, you know, the overall economy, the absolute output was growing tremendously. The population was growing tremendously. But for individual households, individual workers, times were hard. And the reason was that we had a very restrictive monetary policy. The return to the gold standard after the Civil War that very much favored wealthy people in Philadelphia, New York, and Boston who had lent money to the government, bought government bonds during the Civil War when inflation was high. And then if you return to the gold standard, you cut prices. And so you were getting, your bonds were getting paid off in dollars that bought much more. But it also meant that if you had bought a farm in Wisconsin <laughs> in 1864 or 1866, then you saw year after year that the price of wheat or the price of hogs fell. If you, were, if you had a mine, a copper mine in Montana, you saw the price of copper fall. You saw the price of, of pine lumber fall. The price level fell by half. And I'll see if I can. Uh, uh, that's the end of the Civil War. This, I think, is uh, a little house in the big woods. Somewhere in here is um, on the shores of Silver Lake in the long winter. And Almanzo and, and uh, Laura get married somewhere in here. But you have this continuing decline of prices that bottoms out here. And my, my grandfather was lucky, was smart enough. He didn't come here until, until things started to go up. Now, when you re get American history, you read about the, you know, the free coinage of silver movement. And William Jennings Bryan Cross of Gold speech calling for it. And I think it's often taught, well, here's a bunch of nuts. It was a real issue, and it was the, the going to the gold standard transferred money from poorer people to richer people. And it contributed to the concentration of wealth that led to the Gilded Age of conspicuous consumption. Um, and it's an issue that at the, at the high school level, at least, and maybe at college levels, we really don't appreciate. Um, period of deflation, deflation had harmed those who had borrowed money. It was also a period of growing economies of scale, where there were economies of scale in bigger companies, bigger steel mills, bigger sugar refineries, bigger packing plants, sort of the, the invention of the modern packing plant in Chicago. But there is no appreciation of the damage done by unregulated monopoly. So we get this growth of monopoly power that leads to the reaction of the, the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890, but that's, that's really ineffective, um, leads to some regulation of railroads, but leads to the progressive era. Um, we, have we have state chartered banking predominates. We do have some national banks, but it's largely state banks, and they're very poorly regulated. And credit availability depends on a chain from New York to regional to small town banks. So that money comes out of New York and goes to regional banks, and regional banks lend, lend to banks in, in places like Fergus Falls and Worthington and so forth, and they lend to farmers, to our grandparents and, and your grandparents. But real estate loans typically are five years with a balloon. So if you're out in Demet South, this met South Dakota, and you, this happens to be your loan comes due, and you hope to just refinance it. Um, but if that happens to be a year when there's a financial panic, you can't refinance your loan. Or if it happens to be a year when there's a drought. And so you get people moving around in part because you could just go broke. You could be farming somewhere. <laughs> But because of things outside of your control, um, because of this, this very short-term loans that had to be renewed, it's very easy to go bust.
Virtually all business loans are callable loans. When money tightens up in New York, the New York banks telegraph the regional banks and say, we need our money back. And the regional banks call the small town or telegraph the small town banks and say, we need our money back. And the small town bank tells its farm and Main Street customers, sorry, but your loan is due. Read the small print. It says, you know, callable on 10 days notice. And there is no central bank akin, either public or private, that's akin to the banks of England, Sweden, or France. Uh, and I think we can let it go with that and move to questions. And I thank you for your patience. I'll back up. That was just a, um, that was just going back to some of these economic ideas of, of imperfect information, transaction costs, search costs, technology. But we, we've really gone over that. The, the network, let me mention network effects. Uh, and the example of the network effect is the first eighth grade girl to get a, a phone that took pictures and could send them. It's not worth much if you're the only person in your class who has the phone. Just as when Alexander Graham Bell you know, invents the telephone, and they, initially there were less than 100 of them in New York City, it's really not worth it because you can call 99 of the people. But when it's 1,000 or when eight of the girls in your class have the phone that you can send pictures with, and then everyone does. So this is the sort of thing uh, uh, the... One person coming to join a friend in Chandler because those people are well established and then you know sends back to his fiance and she says, okay, I'll come. And you know, there are a lot of other people who would like to come with me. And it would be easier if 14 of us came together going through Ellis Island and getting on the train or whatever. Um, so networks effects are in in migration. Once you get a few people from one one area who have who go to a new place and have good information about it. You're not listening to some land agent who's working on commission. You're talking to your friends and they say, yes, here in southwest Minnesota, <laughs> you know, the winds blow strong <laughs> and it's cold, but you can get good land for, and you can pay so much an acre. And this is what it would cost you to get a couple of horses. And no, you don't need to bring the plow, but you should bring the horse harnesses, that sort of thing. Okay, we'll uh, ask questions. Um, I'm going to ask you to use the mic so that everybody can hear the question as well as the answer. And I think maybe hold the mic down a bit because um, I had to turn up the main mic and I think this one is, is a little strong right now. Who has a question? Okay, let me carry the mic over here. Can you uh, relate what you just presented to current migration issues for in the United States? Well, uh, there are a lot of things that apply, but I would just go back to this last thing of the network effects and, and the nearly free instantaneous communication. Um, if you look at international trade, the invention of the shipping container has had far more effects than most trade deals. Okay, it just made shipping goods, especially high value goods, so much cheaper, faster, no pilfering. The ship turns around in 18 hours instead of two weeks. And in the same way, uh, cellular telephony. You can be in a village in Michoacan, and you have a cousin who works on a roofing crew in St. Paul, and he says, hey, you know, the boss laid off two guys, they need, you know, or, or we have more jobs. Um, you know, can you, <laughs> cousin so-and-so and your brother-in-law so-and-so, could you be up here in a month? Um, so I think that, you know, if you look at reasons for migration, it just becomes so much cheaper because you have reliable information. Um, and I think, that, I think that in general, you know, that applies not only to people coming from Mexico. You had early, India set up these Indian Institutes of Technology back in the Nehru era in the 1950s to really have world-class scientific education. And you know, if you were really good and you were enterprising, you might apply 
for a doctorate, doctoral program at Stanford. <laughs> and maybe out of that you could find a job. But now if you're graduating from a good technical university in, um, you know, in India, <laughs> You can go online and look for jobs. And you can go online and talk to relatives and people from your father's village and what have you. And so the search costs have just dropped. And um, uh, immigration is just so much cheaper than it was a century ago. Other questions? OK, here's somebody. Thank you. My maternal great-grandparents, I believe, <clears throat> left, depending on which aunt or uncle I talked to or did talk to, either from Poland or Germany or Prussia. I mean, the, the same yes. grandparents, but I have no idea yeah. which part of that was. So I'm thinking maybe conscription was a problem mm -hmm. for these families that came at that time and then hit the United States, oh. Minnesota, North, northern Minnesota. So then, they, then they're then they here during the Civil War, right? Oh, already? That early? I mean, no, probably not. No. They're here during recessions yeah. and depressions and the First World War. Yeah. So here's one thing I never understood. Did these families serve in the in the army in the First World War? Did, do you believe? I don't know this about my own family. Yes, they were subject to the draft. Yeah, they were. I mean, we had virtually no army in the 18, and we had a very small army in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and a very temporary one for the Spanish-American War. And then, we, and then we increased the military forces enormously uh, for World War I. And yes, those people uh, did have to serve, and yes, it was a contentious matter, um, but but yes. Now there there were a few people. The Hutterites, for example, um, had religious objection, and they were treated terribly. Um, I mean, they were there were a couple of them who were practically tortured to death in in Leaven, at the prison in Leavenworth. Uh, there was very little toleration for for um, conscientious objection in World War One, uh, and there. I was just looking. There was this cartoonist in World War Two, um, Bill Molden, young Kansan, and he ended up being a cartoonist in. He was uh, stationed in Italy, and and one of his cartoons. Um, shows an American soldier talking to three Italian army prisoners of war and says, you know, hey, you know, so-and-so from PS whatever in Brooklyn, <laughs> good to see you again. I mean, there were, I think another thing we underestimate is that there were people who came and went back. It wasn't that everybody came, learned English in a month, was tremendously happy here. People, some people came, and, and, but then went back. Now, in Argentina, they had a system where people, because they're in a different hemisphere, people would go and come back every year, young men working. Uh, they were the Golondrinas, the swallows, who went back and forth. Uh, and we didn't have that so much here. But, but something like 30% of all people who came here went back at least once, not just on a visit, to stay. Now, in some cases, once they were back, they said, oh, no, I am going to go. You know, I'm going to go back to Brooklyn. Uh, but it wasn't that everyone came here and immediately said, oh, this was a great decision. Uh, to what extent was uh, soil erosion a reason for migration within the United States? I once saw a book that talked about two patterns, one where the people said, uh, uh, the farm's going downhill, I better move, and others said, I better buy some fertilizer. Uh, to what extent... Uh, what was that a reason to move around? Uh, it certainly was a factor in the, um, you know, the people who moved from New York State to, say, Ohio, and then it, the Abe Lincoln generation. It certainly was a factor of land wearing out, and land is cheap, so let's just move from Ohio into Indiana, 
Uh, I mean, Lincoln was born in Kentucky, then was, they were in Ohio for a while, then in Indiana, uh, then Illinois. And um, that certainly was a factor. There also was a factor just of poor information. Um, I mean, sort of the whole Dust Bowl thing, where you have people establish a farming system based on a weather cycle that is short term. And they, they happen to, to move to Kansas and Oklahoma and, and parts of Texas and start a farming system at a time of unusually high rainfall. <laughs> and then the cycle rotates. Um, and the farming system they have um, you know, is very susceptible to wind erosion. And they have to get out. My great-grandparents lost their farm during the Depression because they couldn't make the very last payment. Yes. Is that the time period, would that have fit with the balloon payment or the collab loan? Yeah. Uh, un until the establishment of the federal farm credit system, it was extremely rare to um, to have any farm loan longer than five years. And and that was, by 1933, a third of all American farmers had had to move either because they'd lost the farm that they owned or they were evicted from the farm that they, from a farm that they rented. Um, and, you know, that, that susceptibility of, uh, because you were so tied to short-term real estate loans and callable operating loans, um, that was a very common reason for going bust. And often it was, you know, people would have paid for four years that didn't have much left, but if they couldn't come up with the cash to make that payment, they lost the farm. Um, and it usually was such that, yeah, you know, legally, they, they, if the farm was sold um, and there was a surplus, after, you know, but, but if there was no surplus after the war, so it, it, in many cases, they, in most cases, they lost all their money. Oh, one little interesting thing is when I look back at my grandparents' um, titles to farms, they were financed. They got their mortgages from a Dutch insurance company based in the Netherlands, but with a chartered subsidiary here in the United States, and they specialized in making loans to Dutch farmers. But they were for five years with a balloon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you have data on how, what percentage of the immigrants became citizens? I don't. Because like, my, I don't know if my grandfather and grandmother were citizens. Their children were that were born here. But my friend's uh, husband, when he died, the minister made a really big fuss at the funeral that he wasn't a citizen. Oh, my. You know, I think that most did. But I really, I, 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 I'm very much a generalist, and I'm going out on a limb here in terms of my, so I really don't know. There are historians here locally. I think Peter Rockleff at McAllister knows much more about immigration than I do. There certainly were those who didn't. Uh, and another one of the myths is that everybody learned English immediately. Well, there were lots of people of that first generation who came who never really learned English. I mean, when I was a kid in the 1950s, there were Dutch immigrants, the old people in their 80s, who were like Quechua Indians I knew in Peru, where they, they knew a little trade English. They could go to the county seat and record something with a county recorder. They could, you know, deal on a Ford car or something. But in the home, they spoke Dutch. And, and there were many people who never became very fluent in English. Yeah, given your... Uh Given your your uh, talk about the uh, the hardships of the early immigrants, uh, farming, and also a bit on Main Street as well, um, how uh, what are your thoughts about uh, 
small town America today, if you flash forward, where are we? And are some of these small towns just not going to make it? Or how do you view that? I think there's a lot of differentiation. <laughs> My hometown is Chandler, which was population 376 when I was a kid, and it's 276 now. Um, it still has some, some Main Street businesses, but it has a huge um, grain business. And it has a specialized meat packing plant that, that employs something like 300 people. But people don't buy a lot on Main Street. When I was a kid, you went to Sioux Falls, which is about 55 miles, for back to school shopping and Christmas shopping. And now people down there will go to Sioux Falls to have pizza and go to a movie just as casually as, you know, and a lot of the communities down there are bedroom communities for Sioux Falls. People will drive 50 miles to a job in Sioux Falls. Now, when you get, when you get further away from hubs like that, you see some towns that really are just fading away. Um, you know, Worthington, that must be a population of about 12,000 now, and Marshall, they're vital down there. But there are some towns that had a marching band, you know, <laughs> in the in the parades when I was a kid, where they they haven't had a school for 30 years, and and they have no main street businesses. Yeah, what you're talking about generally are long-term cyclical effects. Yes. What? How do those compare to like back in the 80s when interest rates were high and balloon mortgages were common? That was a short term. Is that considered the same? 1880s or 1980s? 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would, I don't know about, I think people refinanced often, but they didn't have to. I mean, they had the option of, you know, people refinanced when it suited them or, or you know, was to their advantage, but they didn't have to. Whereas in the old system, they had no choice at all. The loan was due. You had to in order to be able to afford a home if you were a young yes. family. Yes, yes, yes. Um, if you come back in April, <laughs> there are sort of three related talks. And one is sort of the history of the banking system, of the private banking system. And one is the history of booms and busts. And we're a very boom-bust nation. We're a very, we've, we've always been a very low savings rate nation. We've always been a high borrowing nation. And if you go back, say, to the 1820s and 1830s, to some of the, you know, some of the, uh, uh, the land booms and the canal booms and so on in places like Indiana, uh, we have a lot of cycles. We have a very interesting private banking system. And we have a very interesting system of having any kind of bank regulation or central banks. We had these two banks of the United States for 20 year periods, Alexander Hamilton and then the one that was the recharter, which was vetoed by, by Andy Jackson. And then we have nothing in terms of such an institution until 1913. And, you know, I hear all sorts of stuff, you know, before we had the Federal Reserve, there never were recessions. If you look at the cycles we had in the 1800s and the social cost to them because of sort of the credit system and its limitations and the degree to which things could be triggered by the international gold standard system. One of the reasons why New York banks would call the Minneapolis or telegraph the Minneapolis and Omaha and what have you systems and say we need money back would be if gold was flowing back to London or Paris. Um, and there was no way to adjust for that until we had the Federal Reserve System. Now, the Fed's made a lot of mistakes, <laughs> but it's better to have it than not have it. I have a question, and that is, you know, a lot of people nowadays who have lived, whose ancestors came here in the 19th century, will say, well, my ancestors entered the country legally. 
I know how desperate my ancestors who entered the country in the 19th century were. They would have come legally or illegally. My question is, were there illegal, were there any laws against European migration in the 19th century? Did everybody from Europe come legally? Were there any illegal immigrants? I'm not an expert on this, but there was very little regulation of immigration until we get the Asian exclusion laws after World War One. Well, there's some before, but but it's but really before then, immigration was pretty much it was an open door. I left my lamp beside the open door, yeah. uh, and it isn't until the 1920s, after World War One, and as we get more people uh, of the wrong color, you know, the wrong physiognomy, that we start to limit immigration, and then. And then when we're scared, we tighten things up more. Well, I think that goes back farther for non-preferred ethnicities. Yes. I yes. mean, the, the people that were allowed to come over to build the railroads were not allowed to stay. Yes. So then we got the paper children and yes. or the paper sons. And yeah. It goes back a long ways. But at some point, there wasn't any regulation. Yeah, I, I think effectively between say between 1865 and 1910 there was almost no regulation no no regulation for people of european oh yeah yeah right? yes 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 yes, the yes for asian ex chinese exclusion yeah. act and I, I and i'm not an expert on this but i you know people were turned back at ellis island and if they were ill or something but but it was but there was great discretion given to the guy at the head of the line with the chalk, <laughs> and there was very little appeal. And, and I think there is some research that shows that Southern Europeans and Jews were turned back a lot more often than, than Danes and Dutchmen and, and what have you. I think it's also interesting in all of this that, you know, we have areas where they think, well, that's, you know, Milwaukee's a German town or St. You know, this is a whatever. Here's, we don't have that with French. I mean, a lot of Frenchmen migrated, but do you know of a French agricultural town in the Dakotas or, or Minnesota or Wisconsin? And, and part of that was that um, the French Revolution and, uh, and the Napoleonic era and the Napoleon and the Code Napoleon, the, the Napoleonic uh, sort of laws swept away all kinds of medieval um, land tenure and social things that remained in, say, northern Germany or in the Austrian Empire. I want to interject something here because, in fact, there was some French immigration and we have someone uh, in our history programs who is doing program after program on French uh, immigration to this area through the uh, Little Canada Historical Society. The next program of this sort of French, uh, Canadian, French, Minnesota connection is going to take place at the Shoreview Library. I think it's the second Saturday in uh, February. So if anybody's interested, look in our uh, newsletter. There were some uh, French relations uh, with uh, Minnesota. But let me get back to the questions here. Yeah, regarding the Iron Range, uh, a lot of people got there. They got a one-way railway ticket, and there was a high. I comment on there was a high suicide rate, and a lot of people went back to their home yes. countries. Life yes. was miserable up yes. there. Yes. Well, one of the um, employers with, with the whole immigration thing now. The one thing we don't talk about is employers. And Representative Nunez from California um, has a dairy farm. It's located outside of Sibley, Iowa, just west of Worthington. And if any of you know, uh, just south of Worthington, it's it just across the, the border from Worthington. Now, if any of you know western, southwestern Minnesota, there are all these 5,000 cow dairy operations going in. They're all owned, they're sort of based on the Southern California model. They're all owned by people who voted for Donald Trump. 
and they all depend financially on illegal immigrants. And you know, if if you had the INS come in and raid, I could I could tell you there's one at White, South Dakota, there's one at Rock Valley, Iowa, there's one at Bywork, South Dakota, there's you know, if you had the INS come in and raid 30 dairies along that I-29 corridor, you'd have tens of thousands of Holstein cows with bad cases of mastitis because they wouldn't get milked. But these immigrants are very compliant, docile workers, just as they were on the Iron Range. They brought those people from the Austrian Empire, Slovenes and what have you, because they were very docile workers. They didn't they lack of information that they didn't have many alternatives. So they either, you know, suicide, go back, or just stay there and work. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the inheritance laws in Europe, and like Germany, and that was the oldest son got the farm. And so then let's say the second uh, son came to the U.S., when did the inheritance laws change here and why? Well, I don't, I think outside of the 13 colonies, we never really had primogeniture codified in law here the way it was in Europe. It may, be, it may have been a custom, but I think it, it, there was very little history of it being a law here. Now, this is where I, I get out of my expertise because there is, primogeniture where it has to go, and there's primogeniture where the default is that it goes in case there's no will. But primogeniture was not abolished in the United Kingdom until 1925. Um, I don't think it ever really existed here in law, other than perhaps in the colonies. It, it did exist sort of in social custom. Uh, I think this was also a case where the where the demographic transitions, um, family sizes increased during the demographic transitions. Before the transition, a lot of kids are born and a lot of them die. <laughs> and so you, you know, if you're if dad is 30 and there are a couple of kids, and you're the second boy, there's a good chance that older boy may die off by the time dad dies. You know. Um, and when death rates fell, then it became the probability of that oldest son dying and the next ones in line having a chance fell. And so it was more certain that you might as well move rather than hanging around and seeing if you possibly ended up being the oldest living son. Other questions? Anybody have their hand up? Could you comment on the story in today's paper about uh, Minnesota's immigration being the lowest in a decade? Uh, I was busy getting ready for a presentation, so I, <laughs> I didn't even pull the papers in from outside the door this morning. Um, yes. Immigration is always uh, what have you, uh, food for demagogues and talking about, you know, unprecedented and waves and whatever, you know, crisis. Um, Im immigration across the southern border has been falling for some time. And, you know, I, I'm not, I'll, I'll have to read the story, but I'm not surprised that it is at its low level in a, in a decade. This is a quick question, I think. Um, Ellis Island, my relatives or ancestors came before Ellis Island. Did they come to the same place and it was changed, the name changed to Ellis Island because you got me? I'm not sure where the facility was located. You did have to come in through some sort of immigration. No, it was in, it was in New York. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. But it wasn't Ellis Island. Yes. Um, 1960s. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm, I'm not sure how the system operated. I think that people came in through more ports prior to things being centralized at Ellis Island. 
Um, Ellis Island was not the, you know, you could come in other ways. My penultimate father-in-law, my first wife's dad, came from the Netherlands in 1911. And they came to Halifax and took the train and, and, they, and they were coming to Iowa. They weren't going to Canada, but they came to Halifax, took the train and crossed at Sarnia, Sarnia to Detroit or that, that area. It was cheap, yes, just as it's, if you're going to Cuba, it's easier to go through Toronto then because, <laughs> because you land at the right terminal. In, in, in. So there, you know, it wasn't that everyone came through Ellis Island, but yeah, and I think the, um, you know, I think they just had procedures of when ships docked, they didn't nearly have to dock at a place where the immigrants got off, I think there was some sort of system where just as customs officers went to a boat that tied up at a, at a, a pier in the East River, so immigration officials went. I think we have time for just one more question. Is there anybody who has a final question? If not, I want to lead the group in a special round of applause here. This man came from his hospital bed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ed Latterman. For those of you who enjoyed today, he'll be back in April. <laughs> and next week we have um, Stewardess by the Minnesota History Theater. Hope to see you all then. Thanks very much.